record? Hi. Um, mm-hmm. I should need you guys to help me with so something. So what yeah. I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take 10 seconds, and I want you to think of a really good trivia question. Okay. And a really good question to which you know the answer, but that you could stump the other people, the other smart people sitting in this room, uh, with that question. So I need you to take, I only have like 9 minutes and 20 seconds left, so this is a valuable 10 seconds I'm bequeathing you. So I want you to take these 10 seconds and actually think of a good trivia question that you can stump people in this room. Go. All right, now what I want you to do is I want you to imagine I had every single one of your names in the hat. And I pulled out random two of those names. And if I pulled your name out as one of those two names, you walk down these stairs in the dark, standing on the stage or whatever the lack of stage that this is, <laughs> next to me up here, and faced all these people staring at you with me. And then what I did is, to get through our time slide, is I flipped a coin. And the coin would hold your fate. The coin knows all. And if the coin came up a certain way, there's only two ways that coin could come up. A certain way that would suggest that your job is going to be for the next couple of minutes is to read the question that you came up with. In fact, let's say I didn't have you come up with one question. I gave you a few minutes and you came up with ten. So now you're standing here with your ten questions that you came up with. And you're asking them of your newfound partner in front of all these people to see how many questions your partner could get right. You are, in a sense, the, the questioner, the quiz show host, the little quiz show demonstration. That's one possibility at this point, but The other is that you're the one who has to answer those questions. So you're standing next to your newfound partner, in front of all these people, recorded, video recorded for all posterity's sake, or for at least as long as the YouTube links remain unbroken. And you're answering those ten questions in front of all these people. Okay, not a hypothetical situation, actually. Uh, researchers several years ago at Stanford did this very study. They did this research study and set it up such that students at random were selected to be either a quiz show host or a contestant. And again, it's the very task I just described. And so, again, 10 questions here, and your job as a contestant, if you were that contestant, to answer as many of them as you could possibly get. Now again, they are in this setup, 10 questions. Questions, yeah. no, okay. how many people get right? We're talking Stanford. Right? These are smart students. They're not quite at the top level. But these are right to the <laughs> And so they're standing here and they're answering 10 questions. On average, how many did they get right? And it turns out the answer, four. Not maybe that impressive, right? And again, it's a smart group of people. Why only four questions? And the answer is because it's really hard when you think about what this task entails, right? Subjecting yourself to the idiosyncratic kind of knowledge base of another really smart person. That's actually surprisingly difficult the more to think about it. And I have to admit, and maybe it's egocentric, but I have a feeling that if I had one of these 10 out of 10 trivia matchups with Stephen Hawking, I could figure out categories to some him in. I have a hard I have a hard time imagining that Stephen Hawking has the same combination of knowledge of psychology studies and Seinfeld episodes and <laughs> the, the people who voice characters in the Pixar animated movies that I do. And to be fair, there may be a couple of categories of his that might not be right in my wheelhouse either. Um, but it's a tough thing to do. When I do this in class, here are the kinds of eclectic information that you get from your average tough student. Name all five members of Instinct. Who was the only president to serve in the Supreme Court? Name all five members of Instinct. is one in which this combination of judicial, political history, and pop music boy bands, maybe that's your thing. You have to be pretty lucky to get matched up with that person. For a lot of us, that's a challenging set of questions. That's why we only get four questions right. But that's not the most interesting aspect of the study. Here's what is. The most interesting aspect of the study is, what does everyone else think? I only picked two of you random. The rest of you sitting in the audience, what do you think of what you see going on in front of you? And that's what they were interested in in this study. They asked the observers, the studio audience, if you will, to rate the two actors who were on display in front of them. Specifically, on a scale of 0 to 100, they were supposed to rate the general knowledge base possessed by those two people, the questioner and the contestant. On a scale of 0 to 100, how broad is their general knowledge base? Essentially, not quite, but essentially, how smart are they? Right? And now they knew everything that you knew. They knew that these people had been assigned to these two roles at random. That but for the fickle nature of that coin, the person who had the misfortune of having to answer those questions could have been the one who was asking those questions. They knew all of that. And nonetheless, when they asked these individuals, the observers in this situation, to evaluate the people in front of them in terms of the general knowledge base, they find this. 
Average rating for the questioner 82, average rating for the contestant 47. The same type of data we get every semester in my class when we do this, but I probably just blew the demonstration for any of you who sign up next semester. Uh, in any case, there's a marked difference here. We see what's going on in front of us, and we ascribe some sort of internal explanation for the behavior that's on display in front of us. The conclusion here, the conclusions I should say, are straightforward. Number one, observers tend to overestimate the internal causes of what they see. That's what goes on here. People think, well, I know they were trying to be bold. Man, those are pretty good questions. She's pretty smart. Right? We overestimate the internal causes of what we see. They look right past the power of the situation here in this crucial demonstration. And I argue we do this all the time. We jump to conclusions about personality, about internal causes for people's behavior. <coughs> we look right past the, the situations that actually dictate a lot of the ways in which we think and interact on a regular basis. We would gain a much deeper understanding of the true nature of human nature by learning to stop and appreciate the role of the situation, the role of the context plays. I mean, think about, for example, when we hear about the tourist who passes out on the subway, hours passing before anyone notices, much less does anything. And our knee-jerk reaction is to criticize those passengers, or maybe all city dwellers, right, as being somehow overly callous, unusually callous people. Right? But lost in this reaction is much of what's true about human nature. We overlook the ordinary circumstances that make all of us, yes, you and me included, less likely to get involved in the affairs of others. Consider, for example, research has suggested in an emergency, we're less likely to intervene when we're part of a large group than when we're in a more intimate setting, precisely because we feel less personally responsible for what happens. In fact, simply visualizing being part of the crowd is enough to decrease the likelihood that we help. And so it goes for other domains. I could talk about a wide range of them, but I'm down to like three minutes. And so let's pick one. Even the most mystical, supposedly inscrutable domains of human experiences. Let's talk about love. Right? We think about this as a category, that, as, a, as an experience that we can't really address from a scientific viewpoint. It's something that's hard to define or, or put a label on. And when I ask people, if I ask you right now, what are the most important factors in determining who you're attracted to? Think about how you might answer that question. If I gave you three, what are the three most important factors in determining your attraction to others? And I do this with my students as well. And look, not for personal gain, but again, for <laughs> Very happily married, thank you. Um, how do you respond to this question? Well, here's how they respond. About half of the responses you get from individuals in response to that question of what are the factors that influence attraction are physical characteristics. Specific physical characteristics. Like, oh, let me tell you, they're very specific physical characteristics. <laughs> right down to the Yahoo last semester who wrote right butt as one of the responses. What are physical characteristics first and foremost? And second, there are personality traits. Warmth, intelligence, sense of humor, personality traits, physical characteristics. In fact, when you look at some of the responses from the actual students in my class when we do this, Sense of humor, smile, and good, healthy shape. <laughs> <laughs> Intelligence, brunette, and legs. Fitness, <laughs> 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 body weight, confidence, good looking face, and perhaps my favorite in its, its hippie, mono monosyllabic nature. Face, butt, wit. <laughs> But <laughs> and there's more to it than that, believe it or not. There's a little sliver down here that we don't pay enough attention to. That's context. It's the 3% of people who say things like, well, whether or not I'm on the rebound from a previous relationship, that makes a difference. Or, what my friends and family members think of a potential partner, that makes a difference. We don't think about those things, despite a very extensive research literature that makes it clear that there are a wide range of situational factors and contexts that affect attraction. Things like proximity. <laughs> Just how close we are to other people. There are fascinating research studies of apartment complexes and college dorms. Studies that show you can map out where people live and you can map out their friendships and relationships, platonic and more romantic. Right? If you're moving to a new place and you want to meet new people, pick the apartment near the elevator. Pick the office near the coffee machine. That makes a tremendous difference, and it's not something that we think about all that often. Similarity is another one. Opposites attract. Not so much in real life. It makes for a good movie and a good pop song, but now in real life, it's about similarity. We're attracted to people with similar ideas, experiences, and attitudes. We're even attracted to people who look like us. 
When someone with glasses walks into a room and there are open seats everywhere, they're more likely, statistically more likely, to sit next to someone else who has glasses. <laughs> Same with people with red hair. And it's not something specific about people with glasses and red hair pick their own visual impairment and hair color. <laughs> we're even more drawn to people who are of a similar attractiveness level to ourselves. If you look at dating, online dating, people respond more to ads of people who are quote unquote in their league. Similarity makes a huge difference. Arousal inducing circumstances. When you think about love as working the following way, we fall in love with someone and our heart starts racing, our palms get sweaty, and that does happen sometimes, but sometimes it's the other way around. We're working out and our heart is racing and our palms are <laughs> and we look around and we say, hey look, hot guy on the elliptical, how you doing? And then we start to feel so, so think about that carefully next time you think where you sit in your phys ed classes or, or, or gym routines. Right? Those things make a difference and we don't think about that. So, what's on and on to other domains? Um, what, what I leave you with, my message for you here today, would be the following. That personality type, stable character, they're overrated. They exist, but they're overrated. If you really want to understand what makes people tick, the true nature of human nature, as I said before, if you want to figure that out in your workforce, your personal relationships, at school, everywhere, you have to pay attention to this idea that context is powerful. You have to embrace that when it comes to even our innermost thoughts and instincts and preferences, situations really matter. <coughs> By embracing that very simple notion, you can gain a better grasp on the world around you. I argue that what can also happen is, quite simply, become a more astute, insightful, and a more effective human being. And that ain't bad for, you know, not <laughs> So, thank you guys very much. Thank you.